So what I'd like to do now is to give you a really quick rundown on using R in R Studio. This is in no way or form going to be a comprehensive tutorial. Um, it's something that takes a lot of practice and time, but I want to give you a few things just to kind of get going. Uh, there's going to be some resources linked on some of the tutorial packages that are out there. Uh, I would highly encourage you to use them and to work through them just to get a feel for how R works. Uh, it will certainly be helpful to you. But let's go ahead and start a screen share. I will pop this up. Let me get my R Studio shared with you. Uh, fantastic. This should be popping up. Great. So when you open up your R Studio uh, application program, or whatever you want to call it, this is what you're going to be faced with. Uh, it's a pretty bleak and sparse looking thing. The first thing that I want to direct to you is this console. This is actually R. This area here is, is really where R is. Everything that actually runs is going to be running down here. This is R. This pane here is your environment pane. Anything that you create, any objects that you create, will be created there. Here are our files. Uh, anything that we would, would have in our files uh, that we would typically navigate will be listed here. If we were using projects, this would be a little bit more streamlined. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to mess around with projects in the pretty near future. Uh, it's a pretty handy feature that our studio has and I would like the opportunity to show them to you and we'll, so we'll do that sometime. But let's go ahead and just for the sake of it, check out this console. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of work in here. Uh, it's kind of best used for running one-off code, testing stuff. But let's just, for the sake of it, just so you can see that at the heart of it, R is just a fancy calculator. Let's just do 2 plus 2. If we press return or enter down there, we should get 4. Nothing too surprising there. Nothing too out of the norm. Uh, we wouldn't want to do much of our work in the console, though. Kind of the point of our studio is to give us what's called an integrated development environment. That integrated development, development environment will let us have a, a nice scripting console or a scripting pane uh, to, to have all of our code in one place, give us an ability to look at any visualizations that we have to get help if we need it all in one place. So that's where the integrated part of this really becomes handy. So let's do this. You'll notice this button here. It's this plus sign, a white plus sign in that green background. Let's click on that and let's make a new R script. Control Shift N if you were in the keyboard shortcuts or Command Shift N if you are on a Mac. When you open that, it's going to open up the screen. Right? Nothing too exciting here. Uh, but this is where we can do a lot of our code, write code, and save it all. So what we can do uh, is, is type anything in here that we would want to in terms of our code. So let's start kind of first things first. One thing that we may want to do is to install a package. R works as a series of packages. There are a lot of packages. I think it's over 15,000 packages now. In no way, shape, or form would we ever need to use all of them. We'll only use a pretty small chunk of them. So let's type this. Let's start typing install. And when I start typing install, what you see is that this uh, box pops up of potential functions that I may want to use. This autocomplete function is very, very useful that R Studio has. Uh, since R is case sensitive, any misspelling or errant capitalization or uh, lowercase letter is going to cause problems. So using the autocomplete not only for pre existing functions, but also for objects that you create uh, will save a lot of time and troubleshooting some of that error and it's fewer keystrokes, which is also helpful. So when we hit install.packages, we can press tab to complete the code and let's put in quotation marks here and let's install a package called dplyr. Uh, it's something that we're going to use a little bit. It is for data manipulation. Um, so for any kind of data, uh, if we need to select data or filter data or group by and summarize and things like that, that's where dplyr becomes handy. So we could, if we wanted to, click this run button here to run this line of code. We don't need to do that though. Instead, all we need to do is press control, enter, and it will run that line of code. And you're gonna see that uh, it's gonna start spitting stuff out, creating text down here, and finally, we get our caret here, which indicates that 
our code has ran, it's done, it's not awaiting any more input. When I did that control enter or command enter on a Mac, I just needed to make sure that my cursor was somewhere in this line. It could be at the start, it could be at the middle, it could be at the end, it just has to be on the line. You do not have to highlight this. Nothing fancy is required here. So if you're coming from another uh, kind of console type or, or IDE type program like uh, Spider or anything like that, maybe it works a little bit differently. Our studio is really handy is that it doesn't make you put a lot of work into actually running your code which is nice. The less work you have to do, the better. So we've installed this package. So let's now load this package. We'll load a package by calling library. Library, parentheses. So library is the function. It's saying, go find this package that you have installed and check it out of the library. So it's worth noting here that, you, and you, you've probably noticed already, is when you start to type a package or a, a function, that and you auto complete it with tab that you will automatically get your closures here every closure that is open needs to be closed so here all functions have parentheses it will have an opening parentheses parentheses sorry here and a closing parentheses here create this set of parentheses that will that we'll want to use to close this function and then to load this package all we need to do is type d plier and there we have it. We can hit Control Enter, and there we see that it has loaded successfully. So this is great. We've we've done something pretty straightforward with installing a package and then loading that package through the library function. So that's uh, something that you'll be doing quite a bit of as you kind of progress through uh, using R and R Studio. But it's really not the only thing that you're going to do. What you're mostly going to be doing is using functions to create objects. So it's worth noting that R, like any object-oriented programming language, you will be creating objects, things, and then performing operations on those objects or things. Uh, and functions themselves are also objects. So you are applying functions, which are objects, to other objects to change or create objects. So it feels kind of funky at first, but once you get into it, it'll be pretty straightforward, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll uh, certainly get the feel for it the more you play with it. So let's go ahead and create an object. Let's create an object that we will call X. So we can just type X, and we are going to use the assignment operator, that is Alt minus. So the Alt minus uh, keys on a Windows machine will create this less than hyphen assignment operator. And that's going to effectively say we're going to create an object. Uh, if you're on a Mac, I'm nearly certain that is the option minus uh, keys that you'll want to push. So let's, let's make some X be something really easy. Nothing tricky, nothing, nothing wild. And let's just say that X is going to be one, through 10. So 1 colon 10 will give me every number between 1 and 10. I'll press control enter and just uh, just to see so you can see this this comes up in our environment over here and now let's go up here and highlight X just to, uh, for the sake of it control enter and you can see down in the console right right down here we have spit out 1 through 10. That's great, so we've created an object called X, and that object X is every number one through 10. All right, well, that's that sounds easy so far, uh, but let's maybe try to do something to X. So there's no point in just creating something if we're not gonna do something to it. So let's try this, X times two. Run that, and what did we do? We took every value that's within X and just multiplied it by two. So one times two is two. Two times two is four. So four, so far, pretty clear. And we get all the way up to 20. Excellent. At this point, you'll see that we have some stuff going on in our console down here. It's a good idea always to keep your console clear. So if I hit Control L, and I'm pretty sure that's also Control L on a Mac, it will clear the console. It's something you want to get in the habit of doing early and often. Uh, I frequently will see people who have never cleared their console and they wonder why things are running slow. 
Well, it's because they haven't cleared the console. So do keep it kind of clear because it will make your life a little bit easier. Great. So here's what we've done. We've created X, X is one through 10, and we've taken X and, and multiplied it by two. But maybe we actually want to change X to reflect the change that we made to it. So to do that, we would type X and then assign that to X times two. When we do that, we see that now X has changed to two through 20. So we created that X and then we changed that X. So always think of it like this. Anytime that we have, that we're creating something, we probably want to assign it an object name. If you want those changes to keep uh, consistent, you will want to assign them an object name. Anything that you do, you're probably going to want to create an object for. Now, there are some, obviously, some circumstances where you wouldn't need to necessarily create uh, an object for two plus two, right? That's, that's something you don't need to do. But if I'm wanting to create an object that I know I'm going to continue to use or manipulate in some way, shape, or form, then I'm probably going to want to assign it something. Whatever, whatever name you want it to be, that's fine, with some exceptions. So you'll see here that we created this thing called X. X is a valid name. X, Y, Z is a valid name. X, zero, one is valid. Zero, one X is not valid. So in R, names cannot begin with numbers, right? They need to begin, they need to ideally begin with a letter. Now they can contain numbers, they can contain underscores, they can contain periods, but they cannot contain spaces. So just kind of things to keep in mind of what valid object names are. And hopefully you'll kind of pick up on a little bit more of that as you work through the tutorial, the Swirl tutorial uh, that I will link and, and throw a link out there to you. So uh, again, it will, it will go a pretty long way to helping you uh, pick up on some of those naming conventions that R has. So let's, let's roll on a little bit more here with uh, kind of what we're, what we're doing in terms of looking at how uh, we can do things with R. So what we've been doing for the most part is uh, creating an object that's just a vector, right? It's just essentially one column of numbers. But let's try something a little bit different. So R has a, uh, a lot of different built-in data sets to it. So we're gonna use one of the classic ones. It's boring, but it will help to illustrate some of the points that we need to get through. So if we type MT cars, all right, you'll see that it started to autocomplete. And if we press control enter, you'll see that all of this data pops down here. And it looks like it's in a form that we would kind of expect it to. It looks very tabular, right? Nothing too tricky. Let's try this. Let's type view with a capital V. And within that, so view is the function, we will put MT cars and we'll run that. And what happens is we get a very tabular format here. This is very much like Excel, how we would expect to see it in any kind of uh, spreadsheet based thing that we would open it up in. So nothing wild, nothing tricky, nothing that's too far out of the norm here. That view function gives us a pretty standard view. We have these nice buttons that we can click, we can use some filters, we can do any of that stuff here, but this gives us a nice snapshot of, uh, of our data, all right? So this is where R becomes a little bit tricky though, or any programming language really becomes a little bit tricky is to how to actually interact with those things. So. If we look at any of these columns, we may have some columns of interest. Maybe this miles per gallon uh, would be of interest. So let's do this, MT cars, dollar sign, and when we type that dollar sign, you see that all of those variable names come up. So miles per gallon, for instance. Miles per gallon, we can run that, control enter, and we have all of the values in order, uh, order of, of row for those for that mile per gallon variable. So that's great. But the kind of the mysticism comes in here with this dollar sign. This dollar sign is in and of itself a function. And the function is uh, essentially saying, look inside of this data and find a variable called miles per gallon. So that's what that does. Anytime you need to access an individual variable, you can use the dollar sign. So we can then take that variable and manipulate it any way we would want to. 
maybe we would want to uh, divide it by two. I don't know why we would want to do it, but let's just say that we would want to do that. So if we divide that by two, we can see that those are all uh, have been divided by two. But maybe let's try something a little bit different. Let's go, let's clear that out and take another peek at that data. If we scroll up here in our console, we can see that there's a variable called weight. And it looks like weight is probably been reduced down a little bit. It probably should be in the thousands is maybe what it looks like. So let's do this. Uh, it's still, maybe it's in uh, uh, something else, but let's call it thousands purely for the sake of it. So let's take this empty cars, empty cars, dollar sign, weight times 1,000. And we can run that. All right, that's great. So we get exactly what we want there. But maybe we want to actually create a new column for that. So this is where we can take that code that we just wrote, and let's call this empty cars, dollar sign, weight, thousands. We'll assign that. Now instead of looking inside of here and finding a variable that already exists, it's going to look inside and see that this variable does not exist already. So it will create, which is pretty cool. So now if we would view MT cars, we see that we have this weight in thousands variable right there. So we added a new column to our data frame based upon a pre-existing variable and just doing some pretty straightforward multiplication to everything in that variable. And we could have used other variables in here if we wanted to create something uh, where we were creating some kind of ratio between miles per gallon and weight, right? We could have done that. If we wanted to do anything else, multiply anything, divide anything in here, that's all stuff that we could have done, right? So that's just, that's just taking a variable, manipulating it, and then assigning a new variable based upon that manipulation. So let's try something else. Maybe not necessarily try something else, but I wanna show you something that you will often encounter when using R that uh, if you haven't had any programming experience to this point, may seem kind of weird to you. So I'm going to type MT cars, and then I'm going to type a bracket, right? So these square brackets here. Whenever you see square brackets, it's an indication that we're going to be looking somewhere within that data or that object, whatever it is. Every object is going to have an index value of some kind. MT cars though, because it is a, it's a table, it's a data frame, it has two dimensions. It has rows and it has columns. So if we are maybe interested in looking at individual rows, we could type one comma and then nothing on the right hand side of the comma. And what this will do is it will return the first row of data. All right, maybe instead we want to look at the first column of data. So let's type MT cars, comma, one. This will give us the first column of data, which is that miles per gallon column. Maybe we want to get something very specific here. We want to look at the first row and the first column value, 21, right? So everything to the left of that comma is talking about the rows of the data. Everything to the right of that comma is talking about the columns of the data. So if we wanted to do something like this, MT cars, bracket, comma, miles per gallon, we could also do that, right? Because that miles per gallon is a specific name within MT cars a specific name of a, of, a, of a column, and we can access that directly through those indices. So these things are, are something you're going to see quite a bit of. You're going to see a lot of uh, kind of magic happen in the, in the indices for your objects. So it's just worth keeping in mind that everything to the left of the comma in the index is talking about the rows. Everything to the right is the columns. So you may be at the point now where you would kind of like to start taking some notes on some of this to yourself as you're typing some of this out. So in any programming language, there's this notion of being able to include comments. In R, uh, like a lot of other programming language, the comment is 
the pound key or the hashtag if you would uh, or if you would rather so this is now a comment this is a comment so comments do not rock right they they don't do anything so if you would find yourself wanting to take notes or to leave some kind of comments in your script, this is a good way of going about doing it. You can also comment code out. So uh, if I wanted to maybe comment this whole chunk of code out, I could press Control Shift C or Command Shift C on a Mac, and you can see where I've commented all of that out. So again, this is a really quick uh, and dirty intro into using R and R Studio. Again, it's going to take a little bit of practice. It'll take a little bit of effort. Um, like anything that you may learn and start getting into, you'll notice that it's not going, it may not come easy. Uh, it may be fraught with frustration, and that is just kind of the way it works. It's the way it works for everybody. So don't think that you are alone in being frustrated by this. Um, I've been using R for a long time now, and I still uh, find myself being frustrated with it in unforeseen ways all the time um, and that's a good thing because it means you're learning something new and you're having to uh, kind of pick up on some new information that you didn't already have it will take time it will be frustrating and that's okay and the more you pick up on it the better you get at it the more you learn the more uh, you can solve problems as they come up for the next time so it's one of those where you just kind of have to keep practicing keep working through it and you find a lot more success as you as you work through it so until next time uh, keep plugging away at it and we will circle back around with each other